Welcome to Roofing Applications. This chapter is found in the NCCER Carpentry Curriculum in Level 2, our apprenticeship class. So let's get started. To begin with, as you travel, take note of the various types of residential and commercial structures. Note that many kinds of roof construction and how many different types of roofing materials are used. Part of your work as a carpenter will involve preparing roof decks to receive the finished roofing material. And if you even install roofing material, you may even install roofing material. The roof is the most vulnerable part of a building. If it is not properly installed, it will leak. In some situations, it could even collapse. Safety is a major consideration when working on a roof. So let's jump into section one of this chapter. What our learning objectives are for roof safety. Explain the safety requirements for roofing projects by identifying potential hazards when working on roofs. B, discuss the fall protection equipment required when working on roofs and identify proper protective equipment, PPE, and hazard control devices when working on a roof. As always, when you watch these videos, make sure that you get these uh, trade terms into your notes for use. Make sure you understand what those trade terms mean. So as you go through the reading, you don't have to jump back and look up these terms. They're just part of your uh, part of your lexicon. You understand what, what that word or what that term means. So roofing materials are used to protect, protect a structure and its contents from the elements. Besides rain protection, some materials are especially suitable for use in areas where fire, high wind, or extreme heat problems exist, or in areas where cold weather, snow, and ice problem and ice are problems. However, the design of the structure as well as the local building codes may limit the choice of materials because of the pitch of the roof or because of other considerations at the particular location. 110 Roofing Hazards. Roofing projects have many inherent hazards. Roofing materials are installed at elevated locations. The roof load capacity must be known so that the weight of roofing the roofing material does not exceed the anticipated load. When possible, place loads directly over rafters or trusses. Overhead power lines must be identified, not only for the workers, but also for the equipment operators. And per OSHA, a safe distance of at least 10 feet must be maintained between a power line and a piece of equipment for line voltages of 50 kilovolts or less. For voltage above 50 kV, the distance must be increased by four tenths of a foot for each one kilovolt of voltage. If overhead power lines are present, ensure that they are ensure they are included in the job hazard analysis, your JHA, use non-conductive ladders when working around power lines. Always complete a JHA before beginning a roofing project to identify the potential hazards and recommend action that can be taken to eliminate or minimize each hazard. Potential hazards may be injuries that may occur while cutting roofing materials, respiratory hazards, when applying certain types of roofing materials, flying debris, such as cutting or handling as a result of cutting or handling roofing materials, tools falling from a roof, ladder, or other elevated surface onto workers below. Roofing materials are commonly lifted manually, resulting in twisting or lifting injuries. Many major contractors have instituted st stretching programs to minimize these types of injuries. 1.20, fall protection equipment. Roofers spend a major part of their time working on sloped roofs. Most construction injuries and deaths are caused by falls. A fall protection plan must be prepared for any project where workers will be more than six feet off the ground or on an elevated working surface. Three common types of fall protection are guardrails, personal fall arrest systems, and safety nets. Another method of fall protection is the use of whole covers. When describing personal fall arrest systems, the following terms must be understood. 
free fall distance, which is the vertical distance, a worker moves after a fall before a deceleration device, device is activated, deceleration device, a device such as a shock absorbing lanyard, rope grab, or self-retracting lifeline that brings a fallen person, falling person to a stop without injury, a deceleration distance, the distance it takes before a person comes to a stop. The required deceleration distance for a fall arrest system is a maximum of three feet, six inches. Arresting force, the force needed to stop a person from falling. The greater the free fall distance, the more force is, is needed to stop or arrest the fall. The following sections discuss equipment used in personal fall arrest systems. Body harnesses, lanyards, deceleration devices, lifelines, anchoring devices, and equipment connectors. So the first one, body, heart, body harnesses, full body harnesses seen in figure one with a fixed back D-ring are used in personal fall arrest systems. Selecting the right full body harness depends on a combination of job requirements and personal preference. For OSHA regulations, a person positioning, a personal positioning system should not allow a worker to free fall more than two feet and the anchoring device, also called an anchor or anchorage, which is attached, should be able to support at least twice the impact load of a worker's fall or 5,000 pounds, whichever is greater. Figure one shows your full body harness that we just talked about. Next, what we attach to that full body harness are lanyards. Lanyards are short, flexible lines with connectors on each end. They're used to connect a body harness to a lifeline, deceleration device, or anchoring device. They must have a minimum breaking strength of 5,000 pounds. Some have a shock absorber, which you'll see in figure two, which absorbs up to 80% of the arresting force when a fall is being stopped. Okay, so a deceleration device is next. Deceleration devices limit the arresting force that a worker is subjected to when the fall is stopped suddenly. A rope grab, which we'll see in figure three, connects to a shock absorbing lanyard and attaches to a lifeline. Here's figure three. This is the rope grab, two different types, retractable lifeline and our rope grab. A self retractable lifeline, also shown here in figure three, allows unrestricted movement and fall protection while climbing and descending ladders or working on multiple levels. Lifelines are ropes or flexible steel cables that are attached to an anchorage point. Vertical lifelines are suspended vertically from a fixed anchorage point to the upper end to which a fall arrest device such as a rope grab is attached. Each worker must use his or her own line. This is because if one worker falls, the movement of the lifeline during the fall arrest may cause the other workers to fall. Horizontal lifelines are connected horizontally between two fixed anchorage points to which a fall arrest device must be attached. Anchorage devices, commonly called tie-off points, not to be confused with anchorage points, uh, support the entire weight of the fall arrest system. Eye bolts, overhead beams, and integral parts of building structures are all types of anchorage points for anchoring devices. Wearing a full body harness, before using fall protection equipment on the job, your employer must provide you with training in the basics of fall protection and proper use of the equipment. Inspect the equipment using the following guidelines. One, first one, examine harnesses and lanyards for mildew, wear, damage, or deterioration. Make sure no straps are cut, broken, torn, or scraped. Check for damage due to fire, chemicals, or corrosives. Check that hardware is free of cracks, sharp edges, or burrs. Check that snap hooks close and lock tightly, and that buckles work properly. Check ropes for wear, broken fibers, pulled stitches, and discoloration. 
and make sure lifeline anchoring devices and mountings are not loose or damaged. The general procedure for using a full body harness is as follows. Follow these steps. Step one, make sure you read that thoroughly. Step two, step three, and all the way through step seven on how to properly wear your full body harness. Uh, many of you have experience with full body harnesses. This is a good check to make sure that you're going through these steps every time. So make sure you read them, understand them, and use them. Selecting an anchorage point and tie off. Once the full body harness has been put on, the next step is to connect it either directly or indirectly to a secure anchorage point by the use of a lanyard or lifeline. This is called tying off. When tying off, ensure that your anchorage point has the following characteristics. It's directly above you, easily accessible, damage-free, and capable of supporting 5,000 pounds per worker, never on the same point as a work basket tie-off. When tying off, consider the following. Tie-offs that use knots are weaker than methods of attachment. Knots can reduce the lifeline or lanyard strength by 50% or more. A stronger lifeline or lanyard should be used to compensate for this effect. To protect equipment from cuts, do not tie off around rough or sharp surfaces. Tying off around H-beams or I-beams can weaken the line because of the cutting action of the beam's edges. This can be prevented by using a webbing style, or I'm sorry, webbing type lanyard or wire core lifeline. Never tie off in a way that would allow you to fall more than six feet. A shorter fall can reduce your chances of falling into obstacles, being injured by the arresting force and damaging your equipment. To limit your fall, a shorter lanyard can be used between the lifeline and your harness. Also, the amount of slack in your lanyard can be reduced by raising your tie-off point on the lifeline. The tie-off point to the lifeline or anchoring device must always be higher uh, than the connection to your harness. Rescue after a fall. Every elevated job site should have a written rescue and retrieval plan in case it is necessary to rescue a fallen, fallen worker. Before there is a risk of a fall, make sure that you know your employer's rescue, what your employer's rescue plans calls for you to do. If a fall occurs, any employee hanging from the fall arrest system must be rescued safely and quickly. If a fall rescue depends on calling for outside help, such as the fire department or rescue squad, all the needed phone numbers must be posted in plain view at the work site. When in doubt, call 911. Inspecting the testing and testing fall protection systems and equipment, the inspection of fall arrest equipment should be performed regularly to make sure it complies with OSHA requirements. A good practice is to label, is to tag or label all items of fall protection with the date when the equipment was last inspected and the date it is due for the next inspection. Safety nets should be drop tested at the job site after initial installation, whenever relocated, after a repair, and at least every six months. PPE and hazard control. The following guidelines must be observed to ensure your safety and the safety of others. Wear boots or shoes with rubber or crepe soles that are in good condition. Always wear fall protection devices, even on shallow pitched roofs. Rain, frost, and snow are all dangerous because they make the roof slippery. If possible, wait until the roof is dry. Otherwise, wear special roofing footwear with skid-resistant cleats in addition to fall protection. Brush or sweep the roof periodically to remove any accumulated dirt or debris. Install any required underlayment as soon as possible. Underlayment usually reduces the danger of slipping. On sloped roofs, do not step on underlayment until it is properly fastened. On pitched roofs, install necessary roof brackets as soon as possible. They can be removed and repositioned as shingle type roofing is installed. 
remove any unused tools, cords, or any other loose items from the roof. They can be a serious hazard. Check and comply with any federal, local, and state code requirements when working on roofs. Be alert to any other potential hazards, such as live power lines. Use common sense. Taking chances can lead to injury or death. When working outdoors or in high heat conditions for extended periods of time, take precautions to avoid, to avoid heat exhaustion and exposure to the sun's ultraviolet rays. Wear a hard hat. Wear light colored clothing that is made of natural fibers. If possible, wear tinted glasses or goggles. Use sun protection. Use a sun protection factor or SPF 30 or higher. Sunblock on exposed skin. Drink adequate amounts of water to prevent dehydration, especially in arid parts of the country. Next, scaffold and staging. Scaffolding and staging have been the causes of many minor and serious accidents due to faulty or incomplete construction or inexperience on the part of the designer or craftsperson constructing them. Staging should be designed and constructed by a competent certified person. Inspect on a daily basis by a, inspected on a daily, daily basis by a certified competent person. Even though you have no part in the design or construction of scaffolding, for safety's sake, you should be familiar with safety rules and regulations that govern its construction. The following safety factors should be thoroughly understood and adhered to by everyone on the job site. Any type of scaffold used should have a minimum safety factor ratio of four to one. That is, it should be constructed so it will carry at least four times the load for which it is intended. Roofing material weight adds up quickly when placed in one location. All staging or platform planks must have end bearing on scaffold edges with adequate support throughout their length to ensure the minimum safety factor ratio of four to one. Scaffolding timbers, if used, must be carefully selected and maximum nailing used for added strength. Because scaffolds are built for work that cannot be done safely from the ground, makeshift scaffolds using unstable objects for support such as boxes, barrels, or piles of bricks are prohibited. When the scaffold is placed on a solid firm base and erected correctly, the roofer should be able to work with confidence. Three tag colors are used during scaffold assembly. Green, a green tag identifies a scaffold that is safe for use and meets all OSHA standards. Yellow, a yellow tag means the scaffolding does not meet the applicable standards. An example is a scaffold where a railing cannot be installed because of equipment interference. A yellow tag scaffold may be used. However, a safety harness and lanyard are mandatory. Other precautions may also apply. Red, a red tag, means a scaffold is being erected or taken down. You should never use a red tagged scaffold. Other more common types of scaffolding include ladder jacks, figure five, and pump jacks, figure six. Pump jacks, and to a lesser extent, ladder jacks, are used for applying the starter strip and lower courses of roofing. Ladder jacks can usually be supported, can usually support a two foot wide adjustable length platform up to 10 or 18 feet long. Ladder jacks must not be used for heights over 20 feet. Uh, it can be attached to either side of the ladder and must be separated by not more than eight feet intervals along the length of the platform. Ladders are useful and necessary pieces of equipment for roofing applications and do not cause accidents if properly used and maintained. Accidents are caused by improper use of ladders, ladder not secured properly, structural failures of the ladder, improper handling of objects while on a ladder, and lack of training on proper, proper ladder use. All workers who will be using a ladder must be trained on the proper use of ladders prior to its use. Figure seven shows a ladder erected correctly in relation to the roof eaves. 
for ladder safety, follow these precautions. Always use an OSHA rated ladder sized appropriately for the job to be undertaken. Always inspect a ladder for defects or damage before use. Fiberglass ladders should always be used to reduce the possibility of accidental electrocution resulting from contact, contact with power lines. Avoid using aluminum ladders. Aluminum ladders, if used, should never be raised or placed in situations where they can fall or accidentally come into contact with power lines. For longer ladders, two people should carry position and erect the ladder. Here's your pump jacks figure. Uh, shows you how a pump jack works where you can put your ladder on the near side or the far side, but you crank these handles and it will raise you up the side of the building. Back to ladders, always face a ladder and grasp the side rails or rungs with both hands when going up or down. Take one step at a time. Always maintain three points of contact with the ladder. Remember that an ordinary straight ladder is built to support only one person at a time. Before using a ladder, be sure there's no oil, grease, or sand on the soles of your shoes. Due to the tread composition, some shoes, some shoe types easily attract foreign objects that can cause you to slip on a ladder. Never carry tools or materials up and down a ladder. A rope or other device should be used to raise or lower everything so you can always have hands free while climbing the ladder. Make sure that the base of the ladder is level and has adequate support. Shim the legs or use levelers if necessary. Make sure the ladder is at the correct angle. Always tie off the ladder prior to use. See figure seven. The ladder needs to be secured at its top to a rigid support. Never overreach. Fixed ladders must be provided with cages, wells, ladder safety devices, or self-retracting lifelines when the length of the climb is less than 24 feet, but the top of the ladder is at a distance greater than 24 feet above lower levels. Here's your safe working distance. Um, one quarter of working distance, you need to have that ladder base out at least one quarter of whatever your working distance is. Here's the amount that extends above the roof. It should be a minimum of three feet by code. So you have something to grab onto, turn around and come down that ladder. But measure your working distance and make sure the bottom of this ladder is at least one quarter of that working distance so that you have the right angle for all the support and strength of that ladder. Here we've got roofing brackets. Um, go back one page and make sure I didn't miss any highlights. Oh, there they are. So roofing brackets. Most roofers feel comfortable on a roof with a four and 12 or a five and 12 slope. When the slope increases to six and 12, more strain is placed on the feet and the body. Therefore, a roofer has to be very conscious of the height off the ground and careful with each and every movement. Figure eight shows two types of roofing brackets. Here's our bracket types. They can be nailed into the substrate and then we can use those to stand on to support our feet. Both types of brackets can be nailed firmly to the roof. When installing roof brackets, make sure that they are nailed to the rafters, not just to the roof sheathing. Roof Brackets and tow boards alone are not sufficient to meet OSHA fall standards. Proper rail or a safety harness is required above six feet. That's the end of section one. Make sure you answer those questions correctly based on the reading. And we'll move on to section two. In section two, tools and fasteners. Our objectives identify the tools and fasteners used in roofing. Identify the hand tools used when working on roofing projects. Identify the power tools used when working on roofing projects. Identify fasteners used on roofing projects. Again, commit these trade terms to your memory and your notes so you understand what all these terms mean. A variety of hand and power tools are used to install roofing. 
Some of these tools are unique to the roofing, while others are commonly used for other carpentry tasks. Hand tools. Some of the most common hand tools are a backsaw, crowbar, handsaw, carpenter's level, nail apron, sliding T bevel, keyhole saw, pop riveter, chalk line, and measuring tape. An angle square, caulking gun, tin snips, pry bar, scribing compass, utility knife, framing square, claw hammer, and a flat spade or spud bar for removing roofing, uh, roofing material removal. Other tools that are spe specific to the installation of certain types of roofing are also used. Some are shown in figure nine. Roofing hammer, also referred to as a shingle hatchet, is used primarily for wood shingle and shake installation. The hatchet end is used to split shingles or shakes, and the top edge is marked or equipped with a sliding gauge to set a dimension for the amount of weather exposure for the shingle or shake. Slate roofing installation usually requires three specialized tools, a slater's hammer, a nail ripper, and a slate cutter. The slater's hammer is equipped with a sharp edge for cutting slate and a point for poking nail holes through the slate. The nail ripper has a sharp edge barb on one end that are used to shear off nails under a piece of slate. To shear nails, the ripper is struck on the face of the anvil face of the anvil with a hammer. The slate cutter aids in the trimming of slate and punching nail holes. Various types of tile cutters and nibblers are used. See those in figure 10. Portable brakes are used for the custom bending of flashing materials for any, for any type of roof installation. Heavy rollers are used to flatten underlayment to eliminate buckling under the finished roof or for the application of cold cement, fully adhered rolled roofs, built up roofing, abbreviated BUR, or single ply membrane roofing. Hand grinders with diamond wheels are used to cut slots and masonry for flashing installation. Here we've got our shingle hatchets, pretty common composition shingle knife for cutting our shingles. Here is your roller for flattening that underlayment or used on a built up roof type. We've got a nail ripper. And we also have our Slater's hammer with the nail puller and the sh uh, sharp trimming edge. Worker safety is important on a construction site. Every work site must have a fall protection plan for working on roofs or at certain heights off of the ground. Power tools. Many power tools are used in roofing. We use circular power circular saws, power saber saws, power drills and drill bits, pneumatic nailers. Rules for the safe use of all power tools include the following. Keep all tools in good condition with regular maintenance. Do not attempt to operate any power tool before being trained by the instructor or a competent person on that particular tool. Use only equipment that is approved to meet Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA standards. Examine each tool for damage before use and do not use damaged tools. Always wear eye protection and other appropriate personal protective equipment. Wear face and hearing protection when required. Wear proper respiratory equipment when necessary. Wear the appropriate clothing for the job being done. Always wear tight-fitting clothing that cannot be caught in the moving tool. Roll up or button long or button long sleeves. Tuck in shirt tails and tie back long hair. Do not wear any jewelry or watches. Do not distract others or let anyone be a distraction while operating a power tool. Do not engage in horseplay. Do not throw objects or point tools at others. Consider the safety of others as well as yourself. Do not leave a power tool unattended while it's running. Do not carry, raise, or lower a tool by its electrical cord. Assume a safe and comfortable position before using a power tool. Do not remove ground plugs from electrical equipment or extension cords. Be sure that a power tool is properly grounded 
and connect it to a ground fault circuit interrupter, GFCI circuit, before using. Here are some examples of the power tools. Here's our grinder with a diamond wheel for the masonry application. This is an example of a portable brake, making any type of uh, metal material, any flashings, uh, anything that we need on that roofing project. We have a portable wet saw, maybe for our slate uh, applications. We have a nibbling tool and a snap tile cutter in that slate or tile roof application. Be sure the portable or stationary power tools are unplugged at the power source or disabled before performing maintenance or changing accessories. Do not use a dull or broken tool or accessory. Use a power tool only for its intended purpose. Keep your feet, fingers, and hair away from a blade or, and or other moving parts of a power tool. Do not use a power tool with guards or safety devices removed or disabled. Do not operate a power tool if your hands and feet are wet. Keep the work area clean at all times. Become familiar with the correct operation and adjustments of power tools before attempting to use it. Always follow the manufacturer's instructions as it pertains to its intended use. Keep a firm grip on the power tools at all times. Use electric extension cords of sufficient rating to energize the particular power tool being used. Do not use worn or frayed extension cords. If a tool or extension cord is defective, it must be brought to the attention of the supervisor so it can be tagged and immediately removed from service. Extension cords should not be hung by nails or wire or fastened to staples. Report unsafe conditions to your instructor or supervisor. Power nailers. There are many types of power nailers. Application of asphalt or fiberglass shingles, use the one of these tools that can cut labor time. The use of these can cut labor time in half. Some of the listed safety practices for power nailers are as follows. Always wear safety glasses. They must be an OSHA approved or NS ANSI designated type. Tool operator training is required before using a power nailer. Because operating principles vary, study the manufacturer's operating manual. Be certain to use the type of fastener required by the manufacturer. If pneumatic, make sure that the pressure can be adjusted at the nailer. Treat the machine as you would a gun. Do not point it at yourself or others. Always keep the unit tight against the surface to drive the fastener correctly. Do not use disconnect. Do not, when not in use, disconnect the unit from the power source to prevent accidental release of fasteners. Keep airlines untangled on the roof to prevent tripping. Next are fasteners. Roofing materials are typically fastened to the underlayment using roofing nails or roofing cement. Common roofing nails, common roofing materials must be fastened with nails of the proper length and made of a material that is compatible with or the same as the drip edge and flashing. See that in figure 11 and 12. They show the most common nails used for composition shingles and wood shakes. About one pound of nails per square or 100 square feet is required to fasten composition shingles. Cold asphalt roofing cement consists of modified asphalt or coal tar products and are used in installation of composition shingles, underlayments, rolled roofing, and cold asphalt, BUR or built up roofing. They are spread over large areas with a spreader or a mop. The plastic fibered cement is used for spot repairs or cementing nail heads, shingle tabs, valley overlaps, and saddle materials, and as an exposed sealer for gaps in flashing. Asphalt cements are generally available in one gallon and five gallon pails. Here's our example of some wood shake and shingle nails that we talked about from figure 12. Make sure you look at those and understand 
that you have, make sure you have the right length and you have the right type of nail for whatever your application is. Do the section review questions based on the reading. Make sure you can answer these correctly from the reading that was that you went over previously. Next, we'll do section three, roofing systems and materials. Objective, identify the differing roofing material systems and their associated materials. Identify composition shingles and their applications. Identify rolled roofing applications. Identify wood shakes and shingles and their applications. Identify tile slash slate roofing materials and their applications. Identify metal roofing and its applications. Identify built up roofing and its applications. Identify single ply roofing and its application. Explain the purpose of underlayment and waterproofing membrane. And lastly, discuss the purpose of drip edge, flashing, and roof ventilation. Trade terms, make sure you know these trade terms and you have them committed to your notes. So composition shingles. Composition shingles, we'll see in figure 13, are the most common roofing material in North America. Three tab shingles are made of a fiber or fiber mat material coated or impregnated with asphalt and then coated with various mineral granules to provide color, fire resistance, and ultraviolet protection. In the past, composition shingles were made using asbestos fiber or organic fiber and were commonly referred to as asphalt shingles. The manufacture of asbestos fiber shingles has been prohibited because of the asbestos, because of the asbestos poses a cancer risk and environmental disposal hazards. Organic fiber shingles have been largely replaced by asphalt coated fiberglass mat shingles, uh, simply called fiberglass shingles. More expensive architectural shingles are also available. They're constructed of multiple layers of fiberglass that are laminated together when manufactured or job applied in layers to create a heavy shadow effect, figure 14. They can also have fungus and or algae resistant versions. So here you see our three tab shingle, still pretty common, but architectural shingles are uh, used more often uh, now because they have a, a much longer warranty and lifespan when compared with the original three tab shingle. Composition shingles are generally generally suit every climate in North America and can be and can normally be applied to any roof with a slope of 4 and 12 figure 15 up to 21 and 12. By applying double lap underlayment they can be used on a roof with a slope as low as 2 and 12. However, roll roofing or membrane roofing is usually recommended on slopes lower than a 4 and 12. Standard three tab composition shingles are supplied in squares of uh, in squares 100 square feet with three bundles per square and are also labeled by their weight per square. Here's your pitch guide. The 1 and 12, 2, 12, 3, 12, 4, 12. It's all just divided by 24, whereas a 24, 12. 12, 12 is a 45 degree angle, 24, 12 would be nearly 90 degrees. Roll roofing. Roll roofing, figure 16, is available in 50 pound and 90 pound weights with the same material and colors as composition shingles. Life of rolled roofing is typically only five to 12 years. Shallow slope roofs and used for shallow slope roofs with a slope less than four and 12. Roll roofing can also be used as valley flashing to match the color of the roofing shingles. Rolls are normally 36 inches wide. Wood shakes and shingles, figure 17, are among the oldest materials used in shingling. Many of the architectural fiberglass shingles attempt to rep reproduce the rustic look, sorry, rust rustic visual effect of wood shakes, and they're made using Western red cedar, cypress, or redwood. 
they have twice the installation value, insulation value of composition shingles, are lighter in weight than most other roofing materials, and are very resistant to hail damage. The drawbacks, they are expensive, slow to install, a fire hazard, and subject to insect damage and rot. Wood shingles are machine cut with a, and are smooth on both sides. Uniform in thickness and length, but vary in width. Hand split wood shakes, which are more expensive, are either hand split on one side and a machine smooth and machine smooth on the other, or hand split on both sides. Hand split shakes vary in thickness and width, but are uniform in length. Wood shingles and shakes are also available in four foot and eight foot pre-bonded panels that are in a two ply and three ply sections. See figure 18. They are claimed, they are claimed to be up to two times faster to install than composition shingles and up to four times faster than the install to install than traditional wood shakes and shingles. A simulated wood shingle is also available in panel form. They are embossed with a deep shadow line and random cut grooves that mimic the look of shakes. Simulated shingles and shake metal roof panels that are four foot long and completely fireproof are also available. Tile and slate roofing. Roofing materials such as tile and slate are expensive and heavier and composition shingles. Slate is rarely used today due to its expense. Tile roofing, like slate, glazed and unglazed tile and ceramic tile roofing products, figure 19, are fireproof, rockproof, and last from 50 to 100 years. They're expensive and heavy. It is used in the South and to great extent greater extent the southwest areas of the country because of its fireproof and impervious, it's impervious to damage caused by intense sunlight. Available in Spanish and mission, mission barrel or S style. Tiles are fastened with non-corrosive nails, copper, galvanized, or stainless steel. Copper nails have the advantage of being soft enough to allow the expansion and contraction without causing tiles to crack if they are fastened too tight. Here's some examples of our tile roof, the Mission, Mission S style, many different uh, profiles and accessories to choose from. Because of its durability and resistance to any alkaline corrosion, copper is generally used as flashing. Slate roofing. Today, real slate roofing, figure 20, is probably the most expensive roofing option in terms of the roof framing materials, roofing materials, and increased installation time. It has a service life of 60 to 100 years. Slate is completely fireproof and rockproof. Synthetic slate is made of a fiber mat, usually fiberglass, that has been impregnated and coated with cement. And it looks like real slate, but is lighter in weight. Synthetic slate is still a relatively expensive material and is typically used on structures where historically appropriate materials are required. Metal roofing. Metal roofing is available in a great variety of materials and styles. These materials can be purchased with a baked enamel, ceramic, or plastic coating. Common roofing, metal roofing materials, aluminum, planar coated, galvanized steel, planar coated, turdy metal, heat treated, copper bearing steel, hot dipped in metal consisting of 80% lead, 20% tin, aluminum or zinc coated steel, stainless steel. The most common residential panel roof styles, figure 21, many new engineered, many new engineered performed architectural metal, fascia and roofing, Systems, which you'll see in figure 22, are available for commercial or residential use. 
So figure 21 jumping back. This is our average coverage area. You can get it in the 14 to 18 inch. This is that st a standing seam type. You can see that you've got the leg that sticks up here. Next panel will look like this. It will lock right over that standing leg, lock in place. These can either be mechanically fastened or they can be um, tap down and lock over. But these are very common profiles for many of our roofing materials. You can see how on this end, this piece was made to lap over and seal that. Same with the standing seam we talked about. Or of this type, we have a little gap right here so the water can penetrate and come over when this leg is laid over the top here. Next is built-up roofing. Conventional built-up roofing membrane, we'll see that in figure 23, has been used for over 100 years on very low slope roofs. Built-up roofing, which is field fabricated, consists of three to five layers of heavy asphalt coated polyester or fiberglass felt embedded in alternate layers of hot applied or cold applied vitamins, which is coal tar based or asphalt based. Basically, it's the black tar you see folks laying down with a hot mop. Hot asphalt applications require special heating equipment along with some method of transporting the hot asphalt to the new roof. So here's an example of a built up commercial built up roof. You can see we've got our plywood, we have two layers of insulation, and then we have our alternating layers of the roofing material that we use plus um, the hot bitumen whether it's coal tar or it's an asphalt up on top. So it's a multi-layer process that you see on a lot of older and even newer uh, commercial roof, low slope roofs. Both products uh, are the weatherproofing medium and are used in hybrid built up roof, such as a cap sheet over one or more base felt plies that have been secured with hot asphalt or cold adhesive to the deck board covering the insulation or directly to the insulation. Flame heating equipment, figure 24, that's this, it's a propane model with a torch, can be used for built up roofing and torch down roofing systems. Very common on a commercial roof is a single ply roofing. The single ply membrane system are wholly synthetic roofing materials that exhibit elastomeric properties to various degrees. Single ply roofing systems can be classified as either thermoplastic, which is a plastic polymer, or thermoset, a rubber polymer system. Common thermoset polymer membranes is an ethylpropylene dimonomer or EPDM product. A membrane, the membrane is usually supplied in large sheets or rolls and is spliced together with compatible adhesives or tapes. Thermoplastic single ply membranes have become very popular for commercial and industrial roofing. Two of the most common types of thermoplastic membranes are av available are polyvinyl chloride, PVC, and thermoplastic polyethylene, TPO. An example of a single ply roofing membrane, you can see that they're rolling it out. They're using a seamer to make that seam. You can see this gentleman has seamed this far so far. And here's where it is still loose, but he's using a seamer to heat up that and basically kind of like weld that seam together. Single ply roofing systems are clean and economical to install because they do not use hot asphalt installation techniques common to built up roofing and modified bitumen membrane roofing systems. Single ply membranes are usually anchored to a roof structure in one of four ways. It's either loose laid and ballasted. The perimeter is anchored with adhesives or mechanical fasteners and the entire surface is weighed down with round stone ballast or walking pavers partially adhered is spot adhered to the roof with mechanical fasteners or adhesives, mechanically adhered, spot adhered to the roof with mechanical fasteners, fully adhered, completely cemented down with an adhesive. Roll down here before I start the next section, you can see the loose laid or ballasted. 
This is where you get up on a commercial roof that actually has gravel, rounded gravel, not sharp gravel to penetrate the membrane. But you can see you put down your single ply membrane to the substrate. It is mechanically fastened or glued around the edges. And then you use a ballast layer, basically rounded gravel on top to hold that roofing down. Then you can see other examples of fully adhered. This is mastic. The entire thing is adhered down or mechanically adhered in spots, depending on the type of material, type of fastener. It's spot adhered so that that roof cannot come up. Oop, let me go back on a mistake. We want to talk about underlayment and waterproof membrane. Underlayment is available in 60 pound rolls of non-perforated 1530 and 60 pound asphalt saturated felt, which you'll see in table one. The felt is used under roofing materials. The felt used under must allow the passage of water vapor. This prevents the accumulation of moisture or frost between the underlayment and the roof deck. In areas of the country where water backup under the finished roof is a problem due to wind driven rain, ice, and snow buildup, a waterproof membrane is available from a number of roofing material manufacturers under such names as StormGuard, WaterGuard, or Dry Deck. Some manufacturers suggest that the roof, that the membrane only be applied along the bottom edges of the eaves and up the roof at least 24 inches above the outside wall, along the rake edges, up any valley, around skylights, and on any saddles or other problem areas. Next is drip edge flashing and roof ventilation. So in figure 27, we're gonna see various types of drip edges that are available. This is the most common, that's why it's highlighted. It's style D or a drip cap, goes on the all around the edges of every roof. Uh, and goes over top of the fascia that should have been finished when the soffit was done. This wraps over the top, or it's applied ahead of time, and then we don't nail the face so that we can slip a piece of fascia metal up and underneath. And we start our shingles at the edge of this drip cap or style D and work ourselves up that roof line. But there are many different profile types, depending on the type of metal roofing, built up roofing, um, single ply roofing that you are going to install. Today, aluminum, galvanized steel, copper vinyl, and stainless steel are the most common materials used for drip edge and flashing. All drip edges and flashings must be fastened with nails or staples made of a compatible material to prevent electro electrolytic corrosion between the fasteners and the flashing. The roofing material manufacturer recommends a uh, recommend recommendations for flashing must be followed. Figure 28 shows a W metal, also uh, so named because the profile looks like the letter W, for standing seam valley flashing. Here is our valley metal. This is that W metal. This is for, they say for standing seam, but as you can see, it also helps direct water. Here they're using it for a shingle wood shingle application. The w, w metal valley flashing is preferred if open valleys will be used. Open valleys are defined as valleys where the valley flashing material will be open, will be visible after the finished roofing is applied. Closed valleys can be used only on composition shingle roofs. Proper attic ventilation is necessary to allow heat and moisture to escape so that damage to the roofing and roof deck does not occur. In the winter, ventilation keeps the roof deck cold and reduces the buildup of ice on the eaves. This helps prevent water penetration through the roof and subsequent water damage to the structure. It also carries away moisture so it does not condense on the roof deck, which can cause rotting. In the summer, excess heat can cause overheating of composition shingles, resulting in the early failure of the roof. Residential attics are generally ventilated by convection uh, vents in the form of a gable vent or roof-mounted ridge or box vents. 
So here's some examples, figure 29 of different residential roof vents. We've got gable vents on each end and we're using the open soffit. We're not leaving it open to the elements, but we have a vented soffit either in metal or with vents cut into a wood soffit for air to enter. And as it heats up, it's gonna rise and come, excuse me, come out of our gable vents. We can use a box or a turbine vent to do the same thing. The turbine vent spins and draws air out and this air is drawn in from underneath. Or we can use a ridge vent, which we see very, very often in a new composition shingle on a new roof. You put a ridge vent down um, a majority of the roof line and the same air is drawn into the soffits and then can exit at the highest point, the ridge to keep air moving through so we don't get that buildup and overheating of that roof. The amount of soffit ventilation in square feet or inches must be equal to or greater than the amount of roof ventilation. The proper amount of convection type ventilation is defined as one square foot of ventilation for every 300 square feet of attic area with 50% of the 50% in the roof for exhaust and 50% in the eaves for intake. An example, the amount of ventilation for a residence with an exterior foundation that measures 40 by 60 would be calculated as follows. You got 40 by 60, which is 2,400 square feet. We're gonna call that our attic area. Divide that by that 300 square feet that we need. That gives us eight square, eight square feet of total ventilation required. We turn that into square inches, eight square feet times 144 gives us 1,152 square inches. Divide that by two. Remember, you have to have exhaust is half and intake is half. So exhaust would be at the ridge. Intake would be at the eaves. You need 576 square inches of intake or exhaust at both uh, for the ridge uh, for the ridge and 576 square inches for the soffits. So ridge vents, box vents, and turbine vents are available in a variety of styles and sizes for residential use. We'll see that in figure 30. The manufacturer specifications for a ventilation device must be consulted to determine the amount of free air ventilation in square feet or inches that the device will provide. So here's some types of ridge vent. Um, you have a coarse fiber. It's got a whole bunch of, uh, it's basically uh, got a lot of space in between so that air can move through it freely and we put our shingle cap on top. We have a plastic type that goes over the top with our shingle cap on it and or a metal or plastic type that provides areas for ventilation. As the heat, hot air rises and comes up into here, it finds a pathway out. That is the end of section three. Make sure that you can go back through the chapter and correctly answer all of the questions that pertain to this section of the chapter. Section four, roof installation. Our objective, describe the installation techniques for common roofing systems. Describe how to properly prepare a roof deck. Explain how to install composition shingles. Explain how to install metal roofing. Describe how to install roll roofing. Discuss roof projections, flashing, and ventilation. Again, trade terms, get these into your notes. Make sure you write them down uh, in your notes so you can rely on them as you're reading the chapter and for any other quizzes or assignments that are given to you. Roofing projects must be properly planned prior to installation. The manufacturer's recommendations should be referenced to ensure the proper fasteners are being used for the job, for the type of roofing material being applied. Preparing the roof deck. A typical roof installation is shown in figure 31. Before the finished roofing is applied, the roof deck must be flashed with a drip edge along the eaves and any valleys must be flashed. An underlayment and or waterproofing membrane is usually installed. The underlayment membrane prevents the finished roof materials from having direct contact with any damage, damaging resinous or corrosive areas of the roof deck. It helps resist or eliminate any water penetration into the roof deck. Figures 32 and 33 
show the recommended underlayment, waterproof membrane placement, and drip edge installation. Normally, the drip edge is installed along the length of the eaves first, followed by any valley flashing. After the flashing is secured, both ends are carefully trimmed flush with the roof deck. After the eave drip edge is in place, the exposed nail heads are covered with asphalt. Waterproof membrane is rolled out and flattened with a roll, roof roller before being tacked onto the roof. After the underlayment and waterproof membrane is in place, the rake edge of the roof is capped with drip edge. So here is a diagram, figure 31, that shows the application. We put our drip edge on first. We talked about that, the eave drip or style D, whatever our flashing is for that roof edge, will go on first. Uh, after the roof deck is installed, and then we're going to put our waterproof membrane down. Now that can be tar paper. That can be some of the um, new products that are on, uh, that are uh, basically almost like house wrap, but they're made for roofing applications. And then you're going to put in any eave, sorry, any valley flashings if you have a valley. Once that underlayment is laid down, um, which is this here, then we start up with our rake. The rake is this section side that goes at an uphill incline, where this is the eave. This particular one here is our, say, our underlayment. If we have places where water can get back up underneath our eaves, we have wind driven rain, ice, or heavy snow, uh, code says that we have to put down that waterproof membrane and it has to go at least 24 inches back into uh, or past the exterior wall. After the roof preparation is complete, the finished roof materials can be lifted and distributed equally over the roof deck. To illustrate what I was just talking about, protection against ice dams, in areas subject to heavy snow, the snow will accumulate on the roof. Heat rising through the roof from the inside of the structure will melt the snow and cause ice to build up on the edges of the roof and in rain gutters, creating an ice dam, figure 34. Eventually, it will find its way into the building, and it does that by getting up underneath the shingles, um, and as that heat from the house, so the ice dam builds up because the house is warming up the snow that's on the roof above the living area. So we have heat rising up from our daily use in the house, our heating systems, uh, people being in there, what have you. That's going to warm up that, that ice or snow. That's going to roll down, but then it's going to hit the edge of the roof, usually the overhang right in this area, where there is no heat coming up because it's exposed, it's the same temperature as outside, and that water will refreeze and build up that ice dam. As water keeps uh, thawing and coming down, if there's an ice dam in place, then the water will have to force its way up underneath those shingles, and then that's where we start to see, um, sorry, uh, leakage problems. Eventually, it finds itself into, find its way into the building. This ice dam problem can be eliminated by a combination of attic insulation, roof venting, and the use of a waterproof shingle underlayment. Okay. The underlayment comes in a 36 inch wide roll. So here is the first of that underlayment that goes down. And then we put another piece of that underlayment over the top. Let's say that our exterior wall, we have a two foot overhang right here, follow the cursor, and we have an exterior wall coming down right here. We have to make sure these are two 36 inch rolls that we have at least 24 inches of coverage into that heated or occupied space to prevent water from creeping back up in there. Many sloped roof residences in, in the north have ice damming problems on the roof, usually at the eaves. This is especially true for those residences with finished attics where insulation and venting under the roof deck is limited to the rafter space. That's why we use a waterproof membrane. And it has to go at least 24 inches beyond the inside wall and will prevent water uh, will prevent water backed up behind any ice dam from penetrating into the structure. An ice edge is an exposed metal sheeting mounted from the eaves up the slope of the roof from 18 to 36 inches. It allows any ice dams that form to be quickly shed from the roof during brief thaws. 
So here's an example of an ice dam before we continue. Uh, we are on the outside edge. Here's our interior wall. We are building an ice dam right here because water is melting from the heat of the inside of the building and trickling down and then refreezing in this space. Any water that comes and comes up against this ice dam can may push back up under these shingles and create, create some sort of a leak. So we have to prevent against that. Normally, a continuous sheet of plain or tinted painted aluminum flashing or special standing seam aluminum panels are used for an ice edge, which we'll see in figure 35. There are disadvantages to the use of an iced edge. One, it's not considered attractive. Uh, and for ice edges to be effective, in shedding ice, eave, trough, eave troughs cannot be used on the building. What they mean by eave trough? A gutter system, because it won't allow that ice to move off the roof. So this is some examples of that ice edging. You don't see them very often in our neck of the woods, but a lot of older homes in the northeastern part of the country, you will see that ice edge put in place. Here's the standing seam version they were talking about. Um, here's our exterior wall, so it extends well past that heated, you know, where the heated space starts. So any water coming down will hit this edge and should roll off. This one actually does have a gutter. It's a protected gutter, so the ice can't, uh, it's got a leaf guard on it so that the ice can't build up inside the gutter and push back up and in. You can see this one, there is no gutter water and ice should be able to roll right off of that roof. Next, installing composition shingles. At one time, the three tab square butt composition fiberglass shingle was the most common. The architectural shingle is the most common type of composition shingle now. See those in figure 36. Uh, there's term this terminology for three tab and uh, wood, wood composition are explained in figure 37. Roof shingles can be placed from the left side of the roof to the right or the right side of the roof to the left, depending on the preference of the roofer. All strip shingles should be started with a double first row, which would be made up of a starter row and a row of shingles or a double course of shingles in which two joints have been offset. Under normal circumstances, the shingle can be fastened with four aluminum or galvanized roofing nails positioned at a nailing line from the bottom of the shingle. One at each end of the other and the other two above the adjacent uh, and adjacent to each cutout, which we'll see in figure 38. When laying on a shingle, when laying a shingle, butt the shingle to the previous shingle in the course and align the shingle, then fasten the butt end to the roof. Keep the shingle aligned and fasten across the shingle to the other end. Alignment can be done by using the guide built into a roofing hammer or by chalking lines. Here's your example of different types of shingles. Um, no cutout, single cutout, double cut. This is a composition, two different types of composition shingles to give that um, shingle or shake look. So, on gable roofs for long runs, on a large roof, start applying the shingles at the center of a long run. By beginning in the center, there is less chance of misalignment as you proceed in both directions. So here's the terminology, figure 37 that they were talking about. We have our shingle width right here, the total width of the shingle, strip shingle, or the length of the individual shingle. We have our exposure, that's this piece. That's the weather exposure. That's how much of that shingle will be exposed to rain, ice, snow, and sunlight. We have our top lap. That's how much the shingle is gonna overlap the one previous. And then our head lap, which is uh, the distance from the lower edge of an overlapping shingle to the upper edge of the shingle in the second course below. You can see there's not much head lap, but if we lay them properly, we should have nearly three layers of protection before water can proceed and get up into or underneath our shingle. How to install a long run on gable roof. 
when it comes to the step process, this is your job. Your job is to measure, I'm sorry, measure. Your job is to read and understand each one of these steps because these are the things that we're going to rely on when we have this for a lab section, using these steps to make sure that we know and understand how to lay down a proper strip sheet, strip shingle roof, okay? So make sure you're following steps one through six and understand how to lay out, lay out a roof. Next, we're gonna do a short run. To install a short run on a gable roof, proceed as follows. Again, follow the steps. Make sure that you are understanding the steps and each of the figures in each one of these sections, read the section and then look up the figure to make sure that you have a visual representation of the reading that you just did. Important part that I'll point out right now is making sure that we are correct in our nailing, okay? One, don't set it too low because there's no strength in that. A heavy wind comes up, it'll rip that shingle right off. If it's not set far enough, it's going to wear through the shingle above because we hide all of our nails in this type of roofing with the shingle that gets applied directly above it. Or if it's crooked, same thing. Crooked nail, one that's not set properly, will eventually wear through the shingle that lays over top of it. We need straight and flush nails in order to ensure that our roof system works properly. Uh, here's our figure 39. This is our six inch pattern. Uh, follow that. Use this as a guide when you're reading your steps on proper installation. Depending on the individual or working team, two or more courses may be carried or nailed at a time as the shingling proceeds across the roof. When two people are working together, they usually work out their own system for speedy, accurate installation. Obtain, to obtain different variations of roof patterns using tabbed shingles, only a change of starting measurement is required, which I'll show you in figure 41. Or you can do a ribbon course, which is in figure 42, to give your roof a little bit different look. So it's not all the same pattern going all the way up, which you'll see when you look at that figure. On hip roofs, when you encounter a hip roof, the basic nailing procedures remain the same but the shingle layout starting point has to be at the center of the roof as described in long gable roofs. So single ply layout, there's your four inch pattern. This is the ribbon course, figure 42, where we're just changing up either the look, the style uh, of the shingle that's being applied in wherever you want those ribbons just to change up the roof a little bit. So you have the option of continuing this dual shingle method starting course in either direction until it terminates at the hip rafter, which we'll see at figure 43. At this point, the shingle should be cut into to match the angle of the hip rafter and covered with a hip cap. Exposed nails in the last caps should be covered with roof sealant. Next are valleys. You may encounter an L or T shape, which calls for another variation in shingling procedures. Where two sloping roofs meet, this intersecting valley has to be able to carry a high concentration of water drainage. Shingling becomes very critical and the application must be done with extreme care. So first, our open valley. Snap two chalk lines, the full length of the valley. They should be six inches apart at the ridge or the uppermost part. Here's our hip example before I read on. We all know that a hip roof has every corner of the roof. At the roof, we have a hip coming down to the exterior side of the roof, exterior wall, I should say. So you're gonna shingle each one of these sections of roof uh, all the way to this hip and then cut it off and install your hip cap. This is the one where they say, start in the center and work yourselves to the middle. Like your long exposure, do the same for this side. So back to the valleys, mark the, uh, mark the diverge at the rate of an eighth of an inch per foot as it approaches the eaves. All that means is that if you do six inches minimum at top, what they're showing here, that we're gonna increase by an eighth of an inch or whatever the length of that valley is so that you have a wider section at the bottom 
because you're going to have less water here. And as water is shed to the valley from these two sloped roofs, it's going to get bigger as we go down. So we want to grow as we are building that, that valley in. The chalk line you have snapped serves as a guide in trimming and cutting the last shingle to fit the valley. This ensures a clean, sharp edge and uniform appearance in the valley. Again, with an open valley, we're going to apply metal. This is the, that represents the W style. Um, many times it's just a single piece of valley metal that comes up at least a foot on this side and a foot on this side and goes into that valley and then we shingle to it. The roofing material is cemented to the valley lining uh, and to itself where an overlap occurs because we don't want to nail through this section into that valley metal because it could create a leak. So we want to nail as close as we can to it and then glue or tar everything down from there. A closed woven valley. Some roofers apply asphalt shingles. Uh, who apply asphalt shingles prefer a closed woven valley design, sometimes called a full weave or a laced valley. Composition shingles are the only type that can be used for this pattern, which we'll see in figure 45. It is essential that a shingle be of sufficient width to cross the lowest point of the valley and continue upward on each roof surface a minimum of 12 inches, much like our valley metal. To create the 12 inch extension, it may be necessary to cut some of the preceding shingles in the course back two tabs. The waterproof membrane or 50 pound felt heavier roll roofing over the standard 15 pound felt is placed in the valley shown in figure 45. Note that no fasteners are located closer than six inches to that valley center line. Succeeding courses alternate first along roof, one roof area and then the other as shown in figure 44. So here's a closed valley. There's no metal exposed. And again, what you're seeing is this shingle is wrapped up one side, this one comes over the top. The next course would go over this guy and so on and so forth, all the way up for that laced or woven valley look. Closed valley cut. To create a closed valley, proceed as follows. Again, the steps are on you. Make sure you read the steps and you correspond them with the figures that are highlighted for you so you understand the procedure as these steps are the steps that you'll be tested on or um, used for lab practice to make sure that you can properly install uh, a closed or woven valley. Next, we'll move into metal roofing. Another type of roofing material is corrugated metal roofing or galvanized metal roofing. Only galvanized sheets that are heavily coated with zinc are recommended for permanent construction. Galvanized sheets may be laid on slopes as low as as low as a shallow three inch rise to the foot or eighth inch pitch. Uh, the ends should be overlapped at least eight inches. If the roof has a pitch of a quarter or more, four inch end laps are usually satisfactory. Overlap by an inch and a half corrugations. Uh, to make the roof tight, sheet should overlap, overlap by an inch and a half corrugations uh, that we saw in the previous metal profile. And we'll see that in figure 47A. If 26 gauge galvanized sheets are used, supports may be 24 inches apart. If 28 gauge galvanized sheets are used, supports should not be more than 12 inches apart. Remember, in metal gauges, the, uh, the larger the number, the thinner the material. So a 26 gauge sheet is going to be heavier than a 28 gauge, thus the 24 inch separation, or if you go to 28, you have to have 12 inches of separation between the uh, supports underneath that material. For best results, galvanized sheets should be fastened with a neoprene headed nail, galvanized nails, or neoprene washers, or screws with neoprene washers. Corrugated metal roofing, figure 48, are used on garages, storage buildings, and farm buildings. 47, figure 47 on our corrugated shows we're using the neoprene washers for our fasteners and we're achieving it 
a minimum of an inch and a half overlap, as it was stated, in order to uh, make sure that we don't have any leakage. Normally, these panels are used on roofs with a slope of 4 and 12 or steeper. They can be used on two 12 roofs if a single panel uh, reaches from the ridge to the eave. We don't want any joints in a low slope roof. The panels are fastened to purlins. A purlin is a structural member running perpendicular to the rafters. See figure 48. Normally, the panel is cut so it overhangs two to three inches at the eave. Uh, simulated standing seam metal roofs. Where seaming machines are required, supervisors may have to decide not only when to lease the machine, but how many machines to have on the project. Most systems use screw guns to install self-drilling or self-tapping screws, but some systems require impact wrenches or bull rivet guns for fastening. Standing seam roof systems minimize the number of through the panel fasteners by up to 90%. Therefore, it is crucial that the fasteners be installed correctly. Here's an example of the purlins. You can see the purlins, but make sure you commit that term to memory. Those are the horizontal pieces that go past, they run perpendicular to the rafters, and that's where we're gonna make our fastener attachment to our roof system. Back to standing seam, the direction in which the sheeting takes place has to be considered. Some systems have strict requirements, others are more flexible. The sheeting direction can be found on the construction drawings. Improper installation techniques cause the majority of standing seam roof failures. This underscores the need for special, uh, special training in a particular system being used. Before roofing can begin, the structure must be plumb and level and purlins must also be straight. Until at least one run of panels has been installed, there is no safe place to work from unless a work platform is constructed. The specific sequence of erection of a standing seam roof system is determined by the manufacturer of the given system. Usually a blanket of insulation is stretched across the structural members to provide prior to sheathing. Blankets, blanket width depends on the panel and no more than a, and you keep the stapling edge ahead of the panel, but more there, more, no more than a foot ahead of it. As previously mentioned, installing a metal roof requires special tools and experience. Cover the roof with a 30 pound felt or waterproof membrane. The membrane or felt must overlap the edges of eaves and rakes. The eave trim, figure 49, is then screwed in place before the panels are applied. One at a time and secure the roof deck with T clips on one side of the panel. So this is our standing seam roof. We use our T-clip, we attach the T-clips, whatever the manufacturer's specification is. And what you can see is once it's attached, the next sheet will clip over top, hiding our T-clip, and we have no through the surface penetrations on a standing seam roof. At the joint of any two panels, the joint is weather sealed with a C-clip running the full length of the joint as shown in figures 15 and 51. T-clips are used every 12 inches in high wind areas and, there, and every 18 inches elsewhere. The neoprene, neoprene flaps inside the C-clip seal uh, seal the seam against water penetration. After the first panel is placed at one of the rakes, the rake edge is applied as shown in figure 52. At valleys, the panels are trimmed to the angle of the valley. Channel strips, running parallel to the valley are sealed and screwed into the valley and hold the edge of the panel, figure 53. At the ridge, Z-strips are fastened and sealed to the panel between the seams. Snug rib system. Another type of roofing sheet is called the snug rib system. It utilizes a concealed fastener, which is leak resistant and eliminates through fasteners. The snug rib joint is a highly efficient watertight joining system of a simple nature. The joint is created by engaging the hooked ends of two panels into a Y-shaped extruded spline previously measured and anchored to the purlins with self-templating clips. Here's an example of the 
channel that you put in the valley where your sheets can come in and lock into that. This is what that finished product should look like. Next, rolled roofing. Roll roofing can be installed on underlayment by itself as part of a cold asphalt built up roof or on a waterproof membrane. The weights, characteristics, side lap, top lap, and recommended exposure for double coverage, single coverage, and uncoated roll roofing are shown in table two. Compositions are not used on roofs with a slope of less than two in 12. Wood shingles are not used on a slope of less than three in 12, and shakes are not used on a slope of less than four in 12. Flat roofs should have a minimum slope of one quarter inch per foot. Single coverage roofing with exposed nails is generally used on a slope of two and 12 or more. Single coverage roofing with concealed nails is used on slopes of one and 12 or more. Double coverage roofing with concealed nails is used on slopes of a quarter inch in 12. Make sure all debris is removed from the roof deck and all nails are flush before applying the waterproof membrane and underlayment. Even a very small pebble or protruding, protruding nail will eventually poke a hole through a single layer roofing. The exposed nail method, single coverage roll roofing with exposed nails is generally applied horizontally over underlayment as shown in figure 55. Here are your steps for the exposed nail method. Make sure you follow those steps, read those steps thoroughly, and look at the visual aids provided by the figures. We also have the concealed nail method. To install rolled roofing, use the concealed nail method. Follow the procedure. Step one, again, read it and align it with the figure uh, that it corresponds with so you understand the process. Double covered roll roofing installation. Double coverage rolled roofing is available for both hot and cold asphalt application. To apply double coverage roll roofing, proceed as follows. Read the steps and correspond them with the figures provided. We're going to move on to roof projections, flashing, and ventilation. So a soil stack. Another roofing task is waterproofing around soil and vent stacks. Most building Roofs have pipes or vents emerging from them. Most are circular and they call for a special flashing method. Various types of vent stack flashing are available for this purpose. You'll see those in figure 65. To apply vent stack flashing, proceed as follows. Follow your steps, make sure you read them and correspond them with the appropriate figures. Next is vertical wall flashing. In the process of roof construction, there are times when the roof abuts a vertical wall or horizontally at an angle. Extreme care must be taken to follow the correct procedures. An example of a sloped or angled abutment is shown in figure 69. The, in, the initial step is to let the underlayment turn up on the vertical wall a minimum of three to four inches. Wall flashing or step flashing can be used when a rake of the roof abuts a vertical wall. Remember the rake is the sloping part of the roof. Step flashing shingles are applied over the end of each course of shingle and covered by the next succeeding course. They're approximately six to seven inches long and from five to six inches wide. A careful study of figure 69 shows that each flashing shingle is placed just up the roof from the exposed edge of the shingle that it overlaps. When the finished siding or clapboards are brought down over this flashing, they serve as a cap flashing, sometimes referred to as counter flashing. Sometimes referred, oh, I'm sorry, and a one inch uh, reveal margin is used. On a horizontal abutment, figure 70, 
continuous flashing must be applied horizontally across the entire top of the abutting roof and against the vertical wall under the siding. Continuous flashing can be formed with a metal brake or by hand as shown in figure 71, and it should be at least nine inches wide, four inches of flashing on the roof and five inches of the wall. Before applying the flashing, adjust the last two courses of your shingles so that the last course, which will be trimmed to butt against the wall, is at least eight inches wide. Do not nail the flashing to the wall or roof deck. If desired, apply several beads of roofing cement to the top of the flashing. Here's your example of your step flashing. You can see the roofing, roofing installer is putting our nail fl our flashing in and he's leaving it up from our, our uh, shingle. And the next shingle will apply, go over the top of it and hide it as you see here. Here's the cap flashing, the siding going over the top that was explained. We have, looks like five inches on the, I'm sorry, four inches here coming up the side. And then we put our cap flashing down. This is where we have single tabs cut and cemented to the flashing because we have just a flat flashing. It's not a step flashing. And we flashed up the side. Siding will come down and cover that flashing. So it's not an eyesore. Dormer roof valley. The installation of a dormer roof valley requires you to combine some of the procedures previously covered. So figure 73 shows an open valley for a gable dormer roof. Extreme care must be used during the installation of the last course against the vertical wall to ensure the, a tight, dry fit. Figure 74 displays the standard valley procedures for dormer flashing and shows how the valley material overlaps the course of shingles to the exposure line for a watertight seal. Regular valley nailing procedures are used until the work proceeds past the dormer ridge. We'll see that in figure 75. Next are chimneys, another penetration that you might run into on a, on a roof. Chimneys are subject to varying loads and, cert and certain opposing structural movement due to winds, temperature changes, and settling. Therefore, roofing materials and base flashing should not be attached or cemented to both the chimney and the roof deck. A cricket, also called a saddle, must be made, which we'll see in figure 76. Here's your dormer flashing. You can see that now we've got, we've created a valley because we have a, a, a gable dormer sticking out from the building. So we have to use our valley flashing and we have to, or yeah, either, either a valley flashing, we should have a flashing under, and then we can do a close or a weave on this. But the same valley rules apply here. And we wanna make sure that we have a reference chalk line so that we're very tight and we make sure we come all the way up and over. So we have a nice seal right up here at the top as explained in the text so that we don't have a, an issue with a water leak at this dormer. Here's an example of a cricket. A cricket placed behind the chimney keeps water or melting snow and ice from building up on the back side of the chimney. You can see that if water is coming down our slope, it's just going to build up on this, on this uh, back side of the chimney and either cause damage to our brick, to the mortar, or be able to push up underneath our shingles, kind of like an ice dam, and create some real leak problems around that chimney. So figure, uh, what we'll see is up here in figure 36 is how we can build our, our chip, chimney cricket. The height of a cricket is typically half the width of the chimney, although these requirements will vary. So check local codes. On, a wide, on wide chimneys, it may be necessary to frame the cricket as shown in figure 77. Flashing at the point where the chimney occurs, chimney, I'm sorry, chimney comes through the roof requires some flashing that will allow movement without damage to the water seal. To apply chimney flashing, proceed as follows. Follow your steps and make sure you reference those back to the figures as we have for all the other step-by-step -step processes in these chapters.
hip or ridge row or our cap row. Special shingles are required to complete the hip or ridge rows. Architectural shingles have a matching cap row shingle, we'll see in figure 84, that must be used. Cap row shingles cannot be cut from architectural shingles. Okay. To install a hip or a row, proceed as follows. Again, with our steps, make sure you follow those steps, read them thoroughly, and align them with the proper figures that correspond with those steps. Nailing of the ridge row is similar to that described for the overall hip. Nailing takes place from, from both edges of the ridge. The ridge cap should be started at the point of the roof opposite the wind direction. That's so they don't lift up. So we want our back to the wind when we're installing the ridge, uh, prevailing wind, just like you see in this picture here. The wind should be coming from this direction. Our roofer is facing the, his back is to the wind so that wind can't get up underneath these uh, ridge edges and push it up. The junction of the roof ridge and any hip can be capped with a special molded cap or by a fabricated end cap shown in figure 88. Uh, this shows a good step-by-step -step procedure that you can see with pictures on how we're going to install our cap flashing around a chimney. We actually have to embed the top edge of our flashing into a groove that we make with our grinder and a diamond blade. Make sure you've got proper PPE before using that tool so that no water can run down the face of this brick and get behind that piece of flashing and then into our roof system and cause a leak. Figure 88 shows that special cap piece or one that's fabricated to create that end where we have a hip. Next, installing uh, vent boxes. So a vent box, which we'll see in figure 89, on new roofs, the proper size hole is cut in the roof and the hole is surrounded with at least a 24 inch wide waterproof membrane. The ventilator or vent is installed uh, with the lower edge of its flashing overlapping the course below it. The flashing is fastened to the roof at the top sides and then roofing courses are applied over and cemented to the flashing at the top of the ventilator. The side and bottom flashing is not fastened. However, the side flashing of the ventilator is completely cemented down to the roofing under the sides. Installing ridge vents, use the following procedures to install ridge vents. Step one, make sure you are reading this thoroughly and completely and using the figures for a visual aid and reference. We're at the end of section four. Make sure that you correctly answer each of these questions based on the content from this section. Go back, review it, and answer these questions. Section five, estimating roofing materials. Our objective describe the estimating procedure for a roofing project. Regardless of the type of roofing to be installed, the amount of material required must first be estimated. After the amount of material has been determined, and obtained, the roof deck must be prepared before finished roofing materials. Um, roofing material is raised to the roof deck and installed, which we talked about in the previous section, making sure that you have all the underlayment. You have your drip caps, you have your rake edge or drip cap up the rake. Everything is ready to go before you bring the shingles up onto the roof. So what we have is steps for uh, estimating our roof system. Uh, and the roofing materials needed. I highlighted here that we have to include any overhangs because they get roofing on them as well, right? So when we we're looking at the attic space, all we did was measure the foundation. We want to go beyond the foundation if we have overhangs. Estimate the size of the overhang, one inch, two in, I'm sorry, one foot, two foot, three foot, wherever that overhang is, make sure that is added into your calculation. So uh, here are the 
procedures for your roof estimation. Here they had 30 by 35 for one section, which was a little over a thousand square feet. They had a 60 by 35, which is 2100, 15 by 35, um, because it was times half, because there was uh, probably a hip, uh, uh, 262.5. Measure up all of your sections if you have a complicated or cut up roof system and add them all together. That's all together, that's half your roof area, which was 3,412 and a half square feet. We double that, we have 6,825 square feet, okay? Um, let's see, they added this one in, 6,450 of roof area. Our total material, sorry, we have 6,475 square feet of roof area. So now we have that figured out. We also want to add a 10% waste factor that covers our uh, ridge, any waste up there, any waste on the uh, hips and valleys, and just a general 10% waste to give us a grand total of 7,123 square feet. We have to convert that into squares because that's the term we use when we order roofing material. How many squares is it? That's a simple calculation. Take that overall number, 7,123, you divide by 100, because a square is 100 square feet, and that gives us 71.23 uh, squares, which is 71 and a third. Normally, uh, you might ask your lumber yard if they'll give you a third of a square. A lot of times they will want you to round up and you'll end up getting 72 squares. Those you can leave, those extra bundles, leave with the homeowner, leave with a customer in case they ever have to do a repair. Uh, starter strips, E flashing, valley flashing, and ridge shingles must be added to the complete, complete the estimate. All of these are determined with linear, linear measurements. So this number only gets you the amount of shingles you'll need to cover that roof space. You have to go along and figure out what you need for starter strip, your E flashing, valley flashings by taking straight linear measurements for all of those. Make sure that you can answer this one question from this uh, section, section five, by going through those steps for estimating a roof section. That concludes this chapter on roofing and roofing materials. We'll see you for the next one.